Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you now to the last uh, session of the meeting, and it's my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Syed Ahmed, who is um, uh, a, a co-director of the uh, UC Cancer Center and the chief of surgical oncology and professor of surgery at UC, who is going to uh, moderate the session. Um, so, Dr. Ahmed. So thank you everyone for staying till the last session. I wanna uh, first, before we start the session, wanna offer my congratulations to Dr. Jazzy, Dr. Lemming and Dr. Barrett putting on what I think we all can agree has been an outstanding um, conference. I've certainly learned a lot um, and uh, hopefully we'll continue that uh, in this session. Um, I have the distinct honor of introducing Dr. Uh, Trish Wise Draper, who um, is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Cincinnati. And Trish is what I'd like to uh, describe as a triple threat. She's an outstanding clinician. She's a, uh, a, a basic scientist and a clinical researcher. She's the head of our clinical uh, trials office um, and uh, currently is leading an effort to bring a SPORE grant to the University of Cincinnati uh, focused on the use of immune therapy and proton therapy for head and neck cancer. And with that, I'll introduce Dr. Trisha Weiss Draper. All right, thank you, Dr. Ahmad, for that very kind invitation or introduction, and Dr. Jazzy for the invitation to be here. Do I just advance the slides with the arrow? Ah, got it. All right, so these are my disclosures. So as far as the outline of my talk today, um, this will be a very different talk than the rest of the talks today. Um, I'm gonna to be going over some of our clinical research at the University of Cincinnati. I'll go through our clinical trials office and the services we offer, as well as our investigator initiated trial program and some of the studies um, mostly focused on head and neck since that's my area. Uh, and then some of our unique experimental therapeutics program opportunities and novel trials. So just to give a kind of a broad overview of what we have at the University of Cincinnati is we have many different trials uh, that really span from newly diagnosed cancer or recurrent and metastatic. We have diagnostic, supportive, and interventional treatment trials, as well as some translational trials and biospecimen um, trials that allow our, our basic science researchers to do clinically uh, relevant uh, research. We have about 130 open, actively enrolling clinical trials, and they can be a combination of industry-funded cooperative group, as well as our invest investigator-initiated trial program. We have a phase one portfolio that allows for trials for all solid tumors for those patients uh, that may not have other opportunities. And we also routinely perform molecular testing on all of our recurrent and metastatic and rare tumors for trial eligibility uh, to make sure that we give them all the opportunities available. Our contact for those that are interested is listed on the, on the slide here. And then please let us know if you're not getting our uh, trial newsletter or email so that we can uh, add you to our mailing list so that you know what opportunities we have. They are also on the High Enroll app as well that I know many places around the city are starting to adopt, which will be great because we'll be able to see each other's trials throughout, the, or throughout Cincinnati. I think it's important to note that, you know, for all of our trials, um, that when patients are referred in, uh, we discuss the trials with them. We make sure that we keep in contact with our primary oncologist because that will continue to be their primary doctor. Uh, and we try to make sure we communicate that. And, and if they do unfortunately fail, that we send them back and make sure that they get the treatment that they may have to offer at that point. This is just an outline of our clinical trials office, how we're organized. Um, I think 
sometimes in academic programs versus some of the private practice groups, we might have a little bit of a different structure. So this just gives you an idea of, of, of how they are staff report. We've actually grown from 16 full-time staff members to 57 in four short years. Uh, so we've grown quite a bit and we have a lot of opportunities. As far as services that we offer, our clinical trial office uh, offers a lot of different um, opportunities or services for our investigators as well as our trainees. We help with protocol development, uh, help design correlatives, so our basic science labs and, and, and have make sure that we have contact with them in case there's anything unique that they would like to do with their clinical trials. We help with the language, the financial operations, as well as regulatory support and patient enrollment and management once the study's open, data entry and management, as well as quality assurance and oversight. In order to open a trial at UC, we have uh, multiple processes that we have to go through, uh, mostly um, that are required for NCI designation once we obtain that. Uh, so this is just gives you an outline of, of how this happens, especially with some of our investigator initiated trials. So protocol development, if we're designing the trial ourselves, the confidentiality agreement, it'll go to our IIT committee, which I'll we'll talk about in a minute if it is an IIT. It'll go to our uh, protocol, it will need to be reviewed by our disease site team, and then it'll go through our scientific review, which is our PRMC, as well as our feasibility committee, which is SOAR contracting as well as pre-regulatory before it goes to IRB. When it goes to IRB, that's when we're working on all of the other important components, our data safety and monitoring plan, um, if it is an IIT, as well as listing on clinicaltrials.gov and all the other things that need to happen, IND application, et cetera. Uh, and then we'll make sure that we get all of the data entry forms ready. Uh, and then finally, we can have our site initiation visit and the trial opens. So it, it can be a long process, especially for our investigator initiated trials, uh, but we do as much as we can in parallel, which has allowed us to um, have a time, our goal timeline is three months from submission to PRMC to activation. Not quite there yet, but we're getting there and some studies are actually going faster than others. This is the support we offer after activation. So again, we have to continue the financial operations, so patient billing, as well as invoicing, making sure patients don't get billed for things they shouldn't be. A regulatory support has to continue as well as the IND annual reporting and everything that goes along with that. Uh, again, patient enrollment, data entry, and continued quality assurance. So to discuss a little bit more about our investigator initiated trial program, I mentioned our IIT committee. This is something we started a few years ago that has been very successful and has allowed us to build our IIT program. It ensures that all cancer-related investigator-initiated trials um, with a UCPI are assessed for our clinical trial office needs. Um, what type of things are we gonna need to do to help support your trial? Early concepts and proposals will get candid feedback from other investigators as well as our clinical trial staff to help make sure that this trial is going to run properly, that it has the right numbers, it's been reviewed by the proper parties. And then we review the protocol for feasibility, of course, as well, and provide all the templates and actually help write the protocol. The committee review and approval is required um, if a PI wishes to use the CTO for, to help support their services. Uh, but most this is done and to help ensure that it goes through the scientific review and IRB process seamlessly. Uh, so there's not a lot of back and forth and frustration from our investigators. I'm gonna talk about head and neck IITs as an example. Dr. Sohal will talk about some GI studies, um, but this will just be an example of some of the studies that we have. So this was actually presented earlier in the head and neck session. So I'm gonna go through it really quickly, but I was gonna just give an example of a successful IIT. This was a large uh, multi-site study. Um, so we are able to, pro to perform multi-site studies where we add on other centers um, and enrolled 92 patients. It was funded by Merck. So this was just the study designed quickly is that it was high risk head and neck cancer patients that were going to surgery. They got a dose of immunotherapy prior to surgery, and then they were stratified based on their post uh, on their pathology, pathology and their risk. Um, as I mentioned, we enrolled 92 patients and it was open at multiple sites. 
Again, this was presented earlier, so I'll go through it quickly, but essentially the gist is, is that the high-risk patients didn't see a survival benefit when compared to historical controls, but the intermediate-risk patients had a pretty significant survival benefit, at least compared to controls of 69 to 96%. The pathological response was another thing we measured during the study since we had the opportunity of having biopsy tissue as well as post-surgical tissue. And we were able to, our pathologist Ben Heinrichs would grade all of these tumors and determine how much of a treatment effect each had. And it's described up there on how we determine this. And what we found is that we had a high proportion of patients who had at least some kind of pathological response. And importantly, those that had a pathological response had a much increased benefit or of survival, disease-free survival compared to those that did not. And it didn't matter whether they were intermediate or high risk. And, the, and they also had an increased overall survival. So this is just one example of a successful IIT that went through the program and has now um, been presented at ASCO as well as um, under review for publication. But these are several of the other IITs that we have in head and neck. Uh, the one in red is because it's completed enrollment. 1702 is about to complete enrollment and Dr. Gulati is going through that data. 1901 and 1903 as well as 2001 are all open. And finally, 2102 is another um, funded study by Janssen that is in development and is going through the approval processes and hopefully will be open soon for our adenoid cystic population. So switching over to some of our phase one studies and our experimental therapeutic program. I mentioned before for um, our, all of our patients, we make sure that we get molecular testing so that we can uh, make sure that we uh, determine if they're eligible for any of our trials. We do have a tapestry trial, uh, which Dr. Sohal is the PI, which has many different mutations and different drugs that are available. These are molecular platform-based studies that allow us to put patients on drugs they wouldn't normally qualify for um, that are available through these studies. And so it's really important that we have molecular tumor boards so that we can discuss any patients that have had molecular testing and determine if they're eligible for these studies. We have also been selected for TAPER and we'll be opening, the, opening it soon. This is another molecular platform type of study um, that allows us to gain access to different uh, drugs that will be hopefully benefit our patients. And this will be opening in the next couple of weeks. We have our SIV. We also have some unique opportunities. So we've heard about cellular therapy. This is a cellular therapy trial that we have in solid tumors uh, ran by IOVANCE. So it is um, taking a tum harvesting a tumor from a patient, either head and neck, lung, or melanoma. We take the, the, we send the tumor off to the company. They harvest the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. They grow them up through their manufacturing. They bring them back to us and in that time frame, we, were, we are doing cytodepletion, so depleting all of the bad immune cells, so essentially a bone marrow regimen. And then we reinfuse the tills and add IL, high dose IL-2 to activate the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in the patient. So this is a very complex study. It requires um, the bone marrow transplant team as well as the solid tumor team to have expertise on both. It requires our expertise of our CTO laboratory that uh, makes sure that all of the media is sterile and gets it to the OR in time, as well as our coordinator. So it, it is a very complex study that we are able to do in Cincinnati. This is another example of a, just another interesting study that's up and coming, but this is going to be one of our all solid tumor studies that will be opening in the next couple of weeks. So we do get dose escalation studies, which are important because usually that includes all solid tumors and allows us to give opportunities to patients that may not have other trial opportunities. Maybe they have a rare tumor or they've progressed on multiple therapies. So this is a bispecific digit antibody. It's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's beyond the first generation. So has a, a has some actual single agent activity whereas digit antibodies by themselves have not unfortunately not shown a whole lot of single agent. And it's included and it's combined with the anti-PD-1 valstilumab. So that's all I have. I know they're saving questions for later. Um, Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. We'll keep the question answer till the end. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Patrick Ward, who is uh, an oncologist hematologist at ORC. He is interested in 
uh, breast cancer, solid tumors, and cancer research. He serves as the co-director of OHC Research uh, Department and principal investigator for the breast uh, cancer study. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'll uh, try and give as impressive a talk as uh, Dr. Draper. Um, so just hit the green button, huh? Okay, so... Um, I can talk really fast. <laughs> Try again, all right. So same thing, hit the green button. All right, I do not have any disclosures. So a uh, brief introduction for uh, our research activities at OHC. We are members of the US Oncology Network and a part of the US Oncology Research Program. Um, as you can see from the slide, US Oncology provides about 12% of cancer care in the United States. And so we have sites all over the country and, um, and the network tries to leverage that in terms of uh, gaining access to uh, pharma, spun, uh, pharma sponsored clinical trials. Um, we do conduct some trials independently, um, but for the most part, uh, our research efforts are run through US Oncology. We have 15 investigators, I'm sorry, 14 uh, physician investigators and 27 support staff. Uh, so far over the past 20, 21 years, we've been able to enroll over 4,000 patients uh, and, and basically at all levels from phase one all the way through uh, late phase clinical trials. This includes um, both uh, heme malignancies as well as solid tumors, um, observational studies, uh, biospecimen gathering studies, data registries. Uh, we also have engaged in some uh, quality improvement and health economics and outcomes research. Um, we're always trying to innovate. That's the purpose of all clinical trials um, and, and clinical research is, is the spearhead of innovation and we try to be right there at the spearhead. Um, my uh, partners run the Bone Marrow Transplant Center at Jewish Hospital and uh, Jim Essel is also the chair of cellular therapy for US Oncology. Um, we're able to uh, participate in um, CAR-T clinical trials, as well as bispecific antibody trials, which are nicknamed BITE and all kinds of other nicknames as well. Um, the CAR-T trials have been in the uh, hematologic malignancy space, and we've been doing those for the past couple of years. We've got 12 patients enrolled. Um, I think they've done a total of 40 uh, CAR-T treatments, um, both on protocol and off protocol. Uh, we also have the um, first person in the world who had a uh, allogeneic CAR-T um, for a blood cancer. Um, we have a bispecific uh, T-cell program for prostate cancer, and so far we've been able to put uh, seven patients on that. Soon we'll have a uh, small cell lung cancer protocol as well. Um, so the Amgen bite trial, uh, we were thankfully one of the first centers to be able to do a solid tumor uh, um, bispecific antibody trial, uh, phase one. It's uh, for uh, obviously later line patients who have failed uh, androgen deprivation and chemotherapy. And um, uh, we've seen some pretty promising uh, responses so far. The, uh, the target is steep one that's uh, uh, expressed on the prostate cancer cell. And then um, it uh, binds to CD3 on the T cell recruiting uh, the immune response. Um, so far, seven patients. I think they're getting ready to open another cohort, and we've got patients waiting to uh, participate. Um, this is 
really cool. Um, so we've been able to participate in a CRISPR edited uh, um, alginaic CAR T cell therapy for relapse refractory uh, B cell non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, the uh, it's a phase one and it's a dose escalation. Um, the uh, the uh, Lipodepletion regimen is listed there as flu sci, and uh, the, the target is CD19. Um, and so far, we've been able to enroll one patient. I think uh, Dr. Essel has another patient in screening right now. Um, we also have the tapestry trial, which is what I refer to as um, a basket trial. In other words, it's a series of uh, uh, molecularly targeted therapies that may or may not uh, have any other treatment options available to them. Um, and typically those are, are um, mutations that are found in uh, tumor types that uh, um, you, you would find uh, the, the mutation and some other malignancy, I, you know, something like finding an ALK mutation in a breast cancer or something along those lines. So, so the, the, the protocol is tissue agnostic really and um, I think there's eight arms for the various um, small molecule inhibitors. Um, it's either targeted therapies or immunotherapies, and it's uh, in, in metastatic disease. Um, we uh, make a great effort to try and molecularly profile all of our tumors uh, with next-gen sequencing, um, as well as uh, assays for determining PDL one um, Typically, the vendor we use is uh, Keras. Um, Dr. Draper had a slide about this as well, but these are the uh, eight different arms of this. And um, if the next gen sequencing or uh, um, PDL1 expression or tumor mutation burden uh, tests positive, then uh, the patient gets screened for participation in, in one of the arms of tapestry. This is um, a, a, an example of a stage three non-small cell clinical trial that we have. And it's, um, it's comparing the, the now standard of care Pacific protocol to um, other uh, immunotherapies in combination with chemo radiation. Um, and the idea is to see if we can harness the abscopal effect any better than, um, than we're doing with the current standard care, which is the chemo RT followed by dervalumab. Um, like I said, the so-called so uh, Pacific regimen. Um, and as you can see, it's in uh, the various locally advanced stage three non-small cell lung cancers, treatment naive. Some examples of recent abstracts. Um, we uh, participated in ASCO's uh, registry for COVID um, to try and better define what the effects of this virus infection are on patients who are undergoing active treatment for their cancer diagnosis. Um, and uh, we also uh, have an effort that's ongoing to try and develop methods for uh, screening patients in later lines of therapy um, as you all know, one of the great barriers to putting a patient on a clinical trial is getting the doctor to recognize the fact that there is a clinical trial and that the patient is an eligible participant. And so um, we have an effort with uh, uh, machine language learning, trying to uh, pre-screen patients through their radiology reports and uh, flag those to the research staff, sort of taking that initial step out of the doctor's hands so that then the research staff can go back to the doctor and say, hey, uh, you have a patient that may be eligible for uh, clinical trial participation. And again, these are usually in later lines. You know, it's, it's not a front line. It's when somebody progresses and they're not thinking about a clinical trial. And so we're trying to develop tools to help them uh, think that along those lines. Um, this is a uh, uh, kind of a busy slide, obviously, but this is about um, the, uh, um, the natural language software effort to try and uh, screen patients. Um, and uh, this was just um, present, or this will be presented at ASCO Quality. Um, 
my partner, Dave Waterhouse, uh, also has um, presented at ASCO recently. Um, and, and these are more um, uh, quality initiatives. Um, we're trying to, to get uh, our doctors to, to follow the standard um, recommendations for next-gen sequencing and, and also some of the transition to biosimilars um, uh, from the, uh, the current uh, standard medications. Um, we're a part of the Mylon Consortium. Uh, and again, this is an effort to try to increase uh, adoption of um, uh, biomarker testing and next-gen sequencing, um, in this case in lung cancer, but obviously uh, the effort is to get adoption across all malignancies. Um, right now, uh, my lung is in protocol two where we're um, monitoring the real world, world uh, journey that a patient takes through their frontline treatment for their metastatic lung cancer and how uh, biomarker testing is utilized. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, first of all, biomarker testing out in the community isn't uniformly uh, pursued. And then when you do get the data, oftentimes um, the docs are not utilizing that data uh, to its greatest potential. And so the effort for my lung is to improve those uh, as much as we possibly can. Um, I think we're going to wait and take questions later. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Pat, for a great uh, summary and talk. So um, we've been fortunate today to have two national experts on pancreas cancer sitting in the room right next to each other. You heard from Shalon Begg earlier this morning, and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Devendra Sohal, who is the uh, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Cincinnati. He also serves as uh, the Director of the GI Oncology Program, the Experimental Therapeutics Program, and is the Acting Director of Clinical Research, uh, Associate Director for the Cancer Center. Devinder is also the national, P was a national PI in the SWOG 1505 study, which evaluated perioperative chemotherapy for pancreas cancer and also holds an R01 grant looking at orphan drug use in solid malignancies. Devendra. Thanks for the kind introduction, Sai. And uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm grateful to Cincinnati Cancer Advisors uh, for the invitation. I've been in Cincinnati about two years, uh, exactly two years. It was October 1, 2019. No one told me COVID pandemic would follow. So I haven't seen anyone. You haven't seen me. It's all been behind masks except virtual meetings. Anyway, these are my disclosures. Uh, our work focuses on GI cancer trials, uh, phase one trials, precision oncology trials. If there's a drug worth trying, I'll try it. I'll give you a flavor of what we do here at UC in our GI cancers program, esophagogastric cancers. We have a study of neoadjuvant therapy. This is a CD40 agonist by apexigen. It, CD40 is an antigen expressed in many cells, especially antigen presenting cells such as dendritic and B cells. And it's a novel immunotherapy mechanism of uh, it, it essentially stimulates, it essentially uh, stimulates the antigen presenting cells to uh, wire up the T cells to try to fight the cancer. It's being added to standard therapy and the patient doesn't have to do a lot more than what they would get anyway, cross chemo radiation, preoperative for adenocarcinomas and squamous cell cancers. Uh, the only downside of this is a mild cytokine release syndrome. Uh, it's managed with, with simple supportive measures. Uh, excellent pathologic complete response rates have been seen. Obviously, the data are under review, so I'm, I'm not allowed to disclose that. Uh, but even in adenocarcinomas, we've seen great success, which is obviously a difficult beast to treat. Uh, the study is ongoing, and we've treated uh, three patients here at UC so far. Pancreatic cancer neoadjuvant therapy, Dr. Ahmad and I had the privilege of leading SWOG 1505. This was the first cooperative group study of neoadjuvant therapy for resectable pancreatic cancer. This was the first study of both frontline regimens in this disease, fulfenox and Gemna paclitaxel. 
Uh, the take-home points, uh, the study was published earlier this year in 2020, uh, in, in January, uh, there was no difference in the two chemotherapy regimens. So the first time that we were able to highlight that, the adjuvant, meaning post-operative chemotherapy completion rate was much lower than pre-operative. Pre-operative people could complete about 90% of the time, whereas post-op only about 45% of the time. And maximizing resection rate, well, that's a no-brainer, is the key to curing pancreatic cancer, which we highlighted in this study. And so based on that, we have a novel adaptive approach to preoperative treatment for pancreatic cancer. We are moving to total neoadjuvant therapy in this disease. As I highlighted, post-op is very difficult to do anyway. So we are enrolling resectable borderline resectable and borderline resectable pancreatic cancer patients, they have to have a CA99 positive, which is our cutoff based on the literature is 75, so at least twice of normal. They get full Firinox, FFX times four, basically two months of chemotherapy. And after two months, we do an early evaluation for response on imaging, response by tumor marker assessment, and of course, response, and of course, tolerability of chemo. So if everything's going well, the scans look good, tumor marker looks good, and the patient looks good. We continue the FFX for the Fulfirinox times eight, meaning four more months of the same chemotherapy. But if not, we switch to Gemabraxin GA. Again, learning from 1505 that essentially the two regimens are comparable. So why not switch to the other one in trying to salvage uh, and take the patient and maximize the chance for resection. Before resection, if there's any vessel involvement, they also get radiation therapy. Uh, this study uh, opened recently. The goal is to understand the proportion undergoing resection. 32 patients is the target. And we have multiple correlatives built in with blood tissue and stool collection. Uh, Dr. Samir Patel is adding in uh, uh, an extra layer of microbiome assessment and dietary modifications for prehabilitation of patients undergoing pancreatic surgery. This is in metastatic disease. Uh, we have uh, an FDA orphan drug grant, which is for uh, first line treatment of Fulfirinox plus uh, ability pharmaceuticals drug. It is an AKT and autophagy inhibitor. So the mechanism is twofold. One is that the standard AKT pathway is impinged upon by the drug, which is activated by chemotherapy. And also due to autophagy inhibition, it leads to more cancer cell death. It's standard inclusion criteria. We've put three patients on so far at UC. In fact, all these, those three patients have been referred from the community around town. Uh, we are grateful for that. The phase one part is ongoing. We have no safety signals so far. Uh, in, in pancreatic cancer, we've also been successful in being uh, selected as a site for Precision Promise. This is PANCAN, which is Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, one of the leading, in fact, the leading advocacy network in the country for pancreatic cancer. They have this portfolio of trials uh, in under one umbrella called Precision Promise. They have multiple uh, academic and pharmaceutical partners where patients can enroll into first line as well as second line uh, trials for pancreatic cancer with novel agents. Uh, we are uh, supported by PANCAN. We have grant funding from them. So we've been recognized for our work so far. UC is the only site in a large uh, area of the Midwest uh, offering this study and it should open in one to two months here. In cholangiocarcinoma, this is Dr. Jordan Karofa's work, who's one of our radiation oncologists, uh, aggressive chemotherapy and radiation in again, a total neoadjuvant therapy fashion. The goal is to maximize treatment delivery. Again, we don't have much evidence of doing anything after cholangiocarcinoma resection. So we wanna move it up front. Uh, the goal is that we enroll resectable cholangiocarcinoma patients, treat them with gemcitabine cisplatin, the standard chemotherapy for stage four disease, treat, treat them with that chemotherapy for three cycles, then we restage them. If all looks well, they get short course radiation only for two weeks, 10 doses, and then they move on to resection. The total duration of neoadjuvant therapy is about 4.5 months. 
the goal again being maximizing resection. This is hepatocellular carcinoma, neoadjuvant therapy, obviously in HCC, liver cancer, immunotherapy has now been shown to work. After about 15 years of struggling with serafinib, we have immunotherapy, atezolizumab, bevacizumab that works in HCC. We wanna move it up front. We have a very strong transplant program led by Dr. Shimul Shah at UC, uh, 150 plus liver transplants a year. We wanna build on that. A lot of those patients, of course, have HCC. We want to try immunotherapy up front. It's scary. You're giving immunotherapy to you're giving immunostimulatory treatment to a patient who's going to get a transplant and be uh, on immunosuppression. So we want to move it up front a little further from the transplant. Patients with HCC and cirrhosis who are listed for a transplant, they have to wait six months anyway. It's a window of opportunity study. We treat them with tremolimumab and tevalumab for four months. After that, they can get local regional therapy to control any. Uh, lesions that need to be controlled, at least a 72-day washout based on the, on the PK and PD analyses available of immunotherapy in HCC, and then they got a transplant. The primary outcome is safety. We'll be one of the first places in the country to study this systematically. Everyone's asking the question. Uh, we'll hopefully have an answer on safety and also on efficacy. We'll collect tissue and blood to do correlatives, of course, um, to understand biomarkers that may predict response or lack thereof. Adjuvant therapy, uh, this is in HCC as well. There's no standard of care after HCC detection or complete ablation. This is Merck's Keynote 937 study. We have it open here, patients after resection or complete ablation for liver cancer, randomized one-to-one -one pembrolizumab versus placebo. Again, there's no standard of care, so there's no real downside to giving placebo. And we'll, the, the primary uh, outcome of this study is recurrence-free survival as well as overall survival. We have enrolled a couple of patients here and we'll see the readout. The study remains open for about one more year. Colorectal cancer, uh, adjuvant therapy is a stage two question that's, uh, that has no answer uh, at this time. There's no clear standard of care. CTDNA, circulating tumor DNA has been noted as a potential biomarker. This study is sponsored by NRG, the cooperative group. Uh, patients who get resected for stage 2A colon cancer are randomized to ARM1, which is active surveillance where samples are bashed and analyzed later on. And then ARM2, which is assay-directed therapy. The assay analyzes CTDNA, and if CTDNA is positive, they get chemotherapy, adjuvant chemotherapy with Folfox or Kpox. And if there is no CTDNA detected, then they are on active surveillance. In the end, we'll see if CTDNA can predict recurrences and uh, also obviously predict a benefit from chemotherapy or not. This will hopefully bring a biomarker into the colon cancer setting. So this study is also available and open at UC. Uh, finally, uh, another plug for phase one precision oncology trials. As Dr. Weisdraper mentioned, we have histology agnostic studies for all comers as well as target specific uh, treatments. Uh, there are novel immunotherapy approaches as well as cellular therapy approaches that we are testing in our experimental therapeutics program. Uh, this is all very collaborative. Uh, I'm grateful to Dr. Jazzy and Lemming who have this honest broker, so to speak, mechanism of second opinions and will refer patients to wherever they can get the best care, whether it's a study at UC or a trial at OHC or just standard of care chemotherapy. The goal, uh, the goal is that everything under the sun that makes sense should be available and, uh, and we should be able to provide it within Greater Cincinnati. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll move now to the next talk by Dr. Uh, Alexander Staroda, who is um, the medical director of oncology clinical trial at Christ Hospital. And actually he is interested in uh, a broad spectrum kind of research that, you know, bringing the innovation uh, into the hospital. He's in charge of the research uh, uh, enterprise there. Alex.
Thank you so much for introduction and thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate uh, Cincinnati Cancer Advisors for that meeting because uh, I'm new to the area. And of course, I'm very much interested to know uh, what's available and want to share with you what's available at the Christ Hospital. Uh, we are rapidly developing program uh, in uh, advanced clinical trials. And I want to share with you one uh, trial that we presented at ASCA. This is my disclosures, and I would move on to the trial we presented at ASCA. Uh, this trial is, uh, was, or was supported by Amphavina uh, uh, Biotech Company. Uh, it used a uh, special tetramer that had four uh, uh, single chain uh, variable uh, elements that were binding CD33 and CD3. By doing that, we were uh, hoping to eliminate myeloid derived stem cells. Uh, of course, you heard today a lot of presentations describing the role of immune oncology and uh, Obviously, persistent question is what makes a tumor avoid those treatments anyway? So there is multiple evidence that suggests that myeloid-derived stem cells, actually one of the uh, components that uh, provide that resistance. And uh, how do we know that? Well, myeloid-derived stem cells, stem cells uh, activated when there is treatment. Usually the more aggressive uh, tumors produce higher uh, levels of myelogenesis in the bone marrow and attract those cells to the tumor itself. By doing that, when they arrive to the tumor tissue, they suppress uh, T cell effectors and upregulate T, uh, T reg cells. Uh, by doing this, they abrogate immune response. If you think about it, they're holy grail of, uh, of the notion that cancer is a wound that never heals. Uh, and uh, of course, the uh, question is, can we remove them from the environment, hoping to produce a better immune responses? So this particular study initially was as a dose escalation study uh, to try to understand recommended phase two dose. Uh, I started that study when I was in Virginia before I joined here. Uh, and for actually one of, my, uh, one of my patients was first patient on the study. Uh, we had dose escalation component with idea of understanding what would be the right dose and uh, to have a different uh, pharmacodynamic readouts. Our patients usually were heavily pretreated on the study, and you see uh, characteristics of those. So what we did see that uh, the in investigational compound does decrease myeloid-derived cells. Uh, it produces significant upregulation of T cell effectors and the suppression of T regs, as well as increased significant increase in the cytokines that would be important for immune response subsequently. So uh, at least uh, in our experience, it did produce what we would intend to see. Uh, we learned that uh, we uh, can uh, be uh, uh, satisfactory producing those results with doses 15 to 50 microgram. Uh, we did push those at some point to 75 microgram, but we thought it was not ideal because at that point we started seeing uh, early signs of CRS. And uh, that's of course, we did not want that. In the doses below 75 microgram, 50 microgram or less, we have not seen any significant CRS. Uh, although, of course, with T cell engagers, it's number one concern. Uh, the drug was mostly well tolerated with injection site reactions, initial um, possibility for fever, but uh, that fever was easily concerned with Tylenol. Uh, all our patients uh, completed the initial uh, phase of trials. I wanted to give you example of one of my patients I treated with very aggressive squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. And the patient had uh, multiple lines of treatment prior to being enrolled in the study. He was 78, he did receive checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, he came uh, at that time to me from Duke University, from my partners when I was there. And uh, I did enroll him in the study and you see he had unbelievable response. Um, to tell you the truth, he called me and said, well, some big chunk of my tumor fell off. They want me to bring to clinic uh, next day. I said, no, 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 please don't. You know, I'm fine. <laughs> Uh, you know, so, uh, and from that standpoint, he had a very significant and impressive improvement in pain control, uh, which uh, initially was extremely hard to control, and he was completely pain-free. 
Um, so a number of uh, different patients stayed on the studies and uh, some of them as long as uh, more than six months. Um, we did see one complete response, uh, several uh, partial responses and uh, some uh, stable disease. Um, so uh, the study accomplished the initial part of finding uh, the recommended dose and moved to uh, more specific cohorts. Uh, now I want to switch gears a little bit and present a different study that we have currently. And I want to talk about the uh, uh, role of uh, casein kinase and the P53. So it, uh, there was a really nice editorial published in 2018 in New England Journal of Medicine where they describe role of uh, casein kinase 1 alpha and the CDK7-8 uh, 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 coordination. So it turns out, you know, if you, uh, uh, see, if you upregulate casein kinase, which happens in some cancers, it leads to uh, P53 inhibition. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a main component and main state in cancer cells. And we believe that P53 availability really drops. And uh, that's one of the concerns in that respect. Uh, so, of course, there was a significant interest to find uh, ways to inhibit casein kinase 1-alpha. Unfortunately, if you do that, what happens is that uh, the signaling through CDK7 and 9 uh, continues, and uh, in, in that respect, P53 will be still inhibited, but better catenins will go up, and that actually, actually oftentimes come, could be pro-tumorogenic. So you have to inhibit both, and that's very well described in that uh, editorial. And of course, there are several cell articles that describe how the whole thing works. So luckily, we do have now dual inhibitor uh, from a company called Biotherix, and we attempted this approach in variety of tumors, including a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and uh, solid tumors, uh, where uh, those tumors have a uh, wild type P53. And this uh, study is going through those escalation component. Uh, want to switch uh, gears a little bit and talk about lymphomas. Uh, you, of course, had uh, heard several nice presentations about this. I want to kind of go back and uh, introduce maybe uh, one important uh, um, uh, feature of the several lymphomas. They highly depend on uh, lipid rafts. What turns out that uh, in some lymphomas depend more than others. What are lipid rafts? They are uh, lipid uh, bilayers that actually harness a, a, a nice home for the tyr tyrosine kinases. For example, FGFR signaling uh, is uh, correlated with presence of lipid rafts in the tumor cells. And you see scale there that shows that on the highest uh, end of uh, lipid raft activity is multiple myeloma in Waldenstrom's. Uh, so there is a now a opportunity to target that weakness in cancer cells using uh, the lipid uh, uh, drug conjugate. So you heard about antibody drug conjugate. This is a different conjugate. It uses a lipid raft that uh, uh, kind of insert itself in the tumor uh, membrane. And it uses radioactive iodine-131. So early uh, human uh, studies showed that Waldenstrom's uh, patients have a 100% response despite being pretreated, uh, and actually it's only for treatments. So really impressive results. Um, uh, there is majority, uh, at least 50 plus percent of multiple myeloma patients have response. Uh, again, uh, triple uh, resistant at, at the minimum. So from that standpoint, it's a promising, uh, promising new uh, approach to see if it can impact uh, resistant disease. So this study opened for multiple myeloma, Waldenstrom's, and the primary CNS lymphomas, because those also turn out to be uh, dependent on the same signaling. I'm going to switch gears a little bit more, and of course, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, these, uh, uh, you know, dual antibodies, you know, that uh, uh, we, uh, you know, bites of different names of them. 
So, so the point here is I want to talk about uh, uh, antibody that produced by uh, immune oncology uh, uh, company that actually targets both CD20 and CD47. As you know, CD20, of course, uh, rituximab being one important component, uh, produces ADCC that activates T cells and that we believe one of the mechanism of action. Uh, CD47, another important component, the drugs that were produced so far uh, did not uh, or used IgG4, which does not produce as much ADCC, so they were not so successful. So it turns out uh, that's important to maybe target both because well, by targeting both signals, we are hoping to induce ADCP, so uh, phagocytosis of the uh, malignant cells. And uh, blocking CD47 unleashes this opportunity for phagocytosis because we are blocking don't eat me signal. Uh, and uh, this study is available for a variety of uh, B cell lymphomas where CD20 is expressed. Um, and uh, so this kind of slide compares how this particular uh, IP product compares to previous attempts. And uh, uh, just to show you that many of them were tried before and failed because either too much toxicity or uh, situations where they did not produce enough response. So that's a, a kind of rejuvenated approach to this uh, that has a good, uh, good potential. Um, I'm going to switch to additional things we have. So one, you know, I for, for a long time been involved with antibody drug conjugates. In fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the kind of my, most close to my heart is Gavitik and Sesituzumab. Uh, I still know it by MU-132 because, uh, you know, when it came out of the lab, I was lucky to actually have the opportunity to administer to patients. And the first patient was triple negative breast cancer. And I'm glad it was first approval of where the drug received uh, that approval. Uh, we also very much interested to work in that uh, direction as well in uh, our current situation. And uh, several antibody drug conjugates being evaluated at our center. One of them targets tissue factor. It turns out that the uh, same thing that causes increased clotting in patients, tissue factor, actually overexpressed in cancer cells. That's not a surprise. It's actually very much known that tissue factor plays an important role in the uh, malignant potential of cells with invasion and other things that happen, especially in pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, and variety of other cancers. Uh, so we now have antibody drug conjugate that allows to target that, uh, that uh, uh, marker and hopefully produce responses in those patients. Uh, other ways to approach it is to use uh, the, uh, the context activated uh, antibody, right? So, uh, and the, this uh, approach was developed by uh, BioAtla, where uh, we know there are some targets are actually important on normal cells. And uh, when you try to target them, you can produce too much toxicity. So you don't want to uh, ADC to target uh, normal tissue. You want to target uh, neoplastic uh, cell. And so you want to antibody bind only under, uh, under uh, acidic conditions. So that's what we have here with Biotla products. Two of them actually in uh, development and we are participating in the study that target uh, uh, RAR2 and Excel uh, antigens on the cells with antibody drug conjugate approach. So uh, those studies are currently intended for no small cell lung cancer and melanoma. Uh, this is uh, what a small part of what we have at Christ Hospital. We have much bigger program than this. Uh, we also have a large pipeline and uh, we hope soon to have opportunity to develop uh, cancer vaccines for uh, colorectal cancer patients, both in uh, uh, adjuvant settings and in metastatic settings. Uh, we uh, also have, you know, we're going to have a rejuvenated uh, interleukin-2 that's actually with much less toxicity because it was modified uh, that we can, we hope to uh, uh, combine with checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, we have additional ways to manipulate in K-cells. So our program rapidly growing and we have different opportunities. And my hope is that, uh, like many speakers already mentioned, that we collaborate on a platform where our patients have better access to each other's studies and uh, have a better result overall. And of course, we have the exactly same promise that we respect primary oncologists and we work uh, in collaboration with the referring doctor. 
So that's what I wanted to present today. And The pleasure of introducing Dr. Getz Cloker, who's coming to us from St. Elizabeth Cancer Center. Uh, Getz is a longtime native of Kentucky, having trained there and was on faculty at the University of Louisville, has expertise in lung cancer, and I believe recently also uh, has edited a, a textbook. So congratulations on that, and we're looking forward to your talk. So I'm looking at the hard core of clinical research, oncology research in Cincinnati. Congratulations. I promise you this will be the shortest talk of the day. And I know you, you heard great data a lot and you want to check on the Bundesliga results. So I promise you this is done in three, four minutes and more a trailer for what is to come next year. Uh, research in St. Elizabeth. Oops. As you probably know, St. Elizabeth started the new cancer center almost exactly a year ago, a gorgeous uh, facility, very spacious and light. And with it came a renaissance of the research office, which had a little bit flatlined. Unfortunately, with this COVID came along. So we were hoping to uh, open these 83 trials that are uh, in our pipeline and we were able to get 30 started. So there's still uh, work to do, a lot of work to do. And as you know, with COVID and getting research staff, uh, it's a little bit difficult nowadays. So what do we have right now? And it's really uh, slim, I admit. We have uh, not too many trials for, for uh, most cancers, for the more common cancers like lung and breast, we have several trials but uh, we have to beef up the program. So again, this is just a trailer. Um, I hope when I invite it next year, I will tell you the rest of the movie. So this is what we have right now. We have a lot of um, uh, energy trials and uh, we shifted our philosophy more to industry sponsored trials. So uh, a lot of these trials have to do with immunotherapy and target therapy, mainly and breast and lung. Uh, we also started some IITs, and I'm excited about uh, liquid biopsies. I think this is a great tool for the future. So uh, we have liquid biopsies to screen for lung cancer. Uh, Sandra Elizabeth has 300, 400 lung cancer screens per month, so 20,000 total. And we thought it makes sense to do a, a blood test for lung cancer. So we just uh, got that activated. Another exciting IIT trial is uh, a liquid biopsy we went to stop immunotherapy. This morning, you had a colleague talk about melanoma, that 50% of stage four melanoma now lists five years on immunotherapy, but when do we stop? So this is an interesting uh, trial based on liquid biopsy on individual cancer DNA that we're looking for in, in the blood to see at what time to stop immunotherapy. So again, I told you this is the shortest talk of the day. Uh, if you have any questions, this is the contact information. There's an app, uh, High Enroll, you probably heard about it, maybe mentioned before. So you can check on this app, it's for free, all the trials that are available in the region, which I think is a great tool. Thank you for inviting me. So we, if we could have all the speakers come and sit at the table and while they're making their way up, do we have questions from the audience? If so, pl please stand. We have someone in the back there on the left. Go ahead and ask your question. Oh, okay. So, um, why don't I get the ball rolling? Um, and, you know, we all had challenges during COVID of, of um, continuing to enroll uh, patients onto clinical trials. And so I'd like to hear from the panel how everyone handled clinical trials during COVID. Um, did you shut them down? Did you keep certain ones open? How was your workflow? How, was, how did you enroll patients? Was it virtual? Was it live? 
Um, and what do we learn from this moving forward? What do we learn from the lessons of the challenges of the past year? So why don't we start with uh, Dr. Wise Draper first, and then, and then we'll go with Dr. Ward next. Sure. So um, it was definitely a challenging time. We did have to shut down some things, but what we decided to do was to shut down our translational program for a bit because um, that wasn't really affecting patient survival. So uh, we spoke to the IRB because initially we thought we were going to have to shut down more than that. And we kind of decided to have a guideline where if we felt that it would affect patient survival, then we could keep the study open. And most of our interventional treatment trials um, fit that category. So we had a team that reviewed all the trials and it's a lot because um, like I said, we had about 130 actively enrolling. So we had to go through those and make sure that we uh, communicated with the rest of the team. But what came out of that, and it was temporary, it was only for a few months, um, but what really came out of COVID for us was uh, being more strategic on how we did a lot of things. Um, we allowed a lot of our coordinators to go remote, um, even the clinical coordinators for a bit during that time. They're, they're all back, but our regulatory staff, our data and QA have all stayed um, at remote, which has allowed us to save on space, which was very limited and still very limited. Uh, it allowed them to be more creative on how they communicated and how we uh, documented. So we almost took everything electronic. So all our con meds, our um, AE reporting, everything is now an epic uh, and route it to the investigator. So we have, we barely have any paper left. Um, our regulatory was already in compliance, but it really allowed us to um, be creative on, on how we did things and optimize our procedures uh, throughout the office. Why don't we go with Get since he's sitting right next to you and, and passing on the mic? Yeah. How did St. Elizabeth handle this? Well, first, we didn't have many trials to begin with. <laughs> then the patients didn't show up. And then, really, we have a shortage of research staff. So uh, it's been not good the last year. Okay. Why don't we go to Dr. Um, Stardub and then, and then Dr. Ward? Oh, well, from my standpoint, uh, I actually moved during the uh, depths of uh, the COVID pandemic because I started in April. Uh, having said that, uh, I am blessed to have a very supportive uh, management team, and we were relatively kind of inventive how we would work around it. Um, our patients uh, continued to come to clinic, and we were able to actually, in fact, uh, accelerate during this time and open a number of new studies. Um, I don't think it's impacted us uh, any kind significantly at this point. Uh, the main impact was is that uh, monitoring visits were difficult because uh, system does not allow full access to the EMR. So uh, oftentimes it's reducting part was difficult. Outside of that, uh, I, I feel like we were not that much impacted, luckily. So we did a lot of the same things that others have done. Um, regulatory and data went remote. Um, you know, we had to pivot very quickly for treatment trials and change all the workflows in the office so that everyone was safe, you know, patients and, and staff. Um, and I don't think there were any disruptions to the treatment trials. Um, most of the regulatory data people are now back in the office. I don't, I, I do think there's still a few people working remotely, um, but for the most part, everybody's back in the office. Dr. Jassy. No, oh, Dr. Soho. Dr. Wise Raper covered it at UC. Thank you. So I have a question actually. So what, uh, for the distinguished panelists here, what do you think the most important step in mind that you know it can enhance the interinstitutional collaboration and research in the region. So we we'll start with uh, Trisha again. Um, so it was mentioned a couple of times and um, the high end roll app I think will be helpful for those that have it. Um, I, that is one way that you can see the different trials and the different centers, those that have, have decided to use it. Uh, I think just getting out there with our portfolios, which is really hard. Uh, with our newsletter, we try to highlight a couple of new ones that we think might be interesting or novel or something that may not be at other centers. Um, 
trying not to open trials that are um, overlapping. So having them at more than one center in the area, which is, which is hard and takes a lot of communication. I mean, I can, I can say from the University of Cincinnati standpoint, we would love to be able to, at least for our IITs, because it's much harder with industry because they have to have separate contracts, but with our IITs being able to open some of those um, in the private practice groups so that patients don't have to travel downtown since they don't like to do that in Cincinnati. Um, so th I think there's definitely some strategies that we can do, but I think communication is key for sure. Well, um, we have that problem for Kentucky uh, that one hand doesn't know what the other is doing, U of L, UK, St. Elizabeth, Paducah. So the Kentucky Society of Clinical uh, Organization, uh, Research, it's a relatively new society, meets monthly, um, we have a conference call and we list the clinical trials that are available in Kentucky and that are active and uh, the PIs exchange their numbers. So within Kentucky, we're trying to have uh, this regional um, switchboard and where we collect information. Uh, we just started that, so uh, I hope it's gonna work out. Just to add to that, I think a lot of it is gumshoe work. We It has to be a, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It's very hard for a patient to join a clinical trial as it is. Uh, and, and for, as has been mentioned, for an oncologist in place A to figure out what's open in, in place B is very difficult. Even if it is open, there may not be a slot. Is the patient eligible? How do you figure all that out? It's a lot of work. Ultimately, it has to be a very collaborative effort. I mean, I have oncologists and, and Others as well, I'm sure, just text me, hey, I have this patient, BDAF mutant, tried NCRAF, and it didn't work. Do you have anything? I'll say, yes, I have, you know, tapestry or whatever, and please send the patient. We are happy to, you know, just email me the name and a name and phone number and we'll get the patient in. You don't have to go through the back office. Or I'll say, sorry, I don't have anything. You know, try, try, you know, XYZ and and or or uh, you know, there's something coming up at another location, uh, maybe try that. So uh, it has to be that mutual trust and relationship building, I think. Um, I'm willing to share my cell phone number with anyone, text me, hey, do you have anything, yay or nay? Just wanna echo your comments and physician engagement is always gonna be, um, you know, a a big part of this as well. You know, folks are busy in their clinics and uh, sort of getting into the forefront of their thought process, um, you know, what protocols are available. And so uh, having tools to, to help facilitate that is gonna be important as well. And one thing I like to add is that I think communication is a common theme and, um, you know, it used to be that one person could pick up the phone and just call another person. Pat calls me, you know, all the time on, on patients and we collaborate. But I think a formalized process of collaborating and communicating may be beneficial. And Bill Barrett and I have talked about starting a citywide tumor board or a molecular tumor board, something along those lines. I think, you know, number one, it allows people to get to know one another. Um, it allows us to bring difficult cases to get feedback from other people. And it allows uh, one system to know what the other has in terms of clinical trials. And, and, and I think we need to be collaborative, we need to communicate, and we need to be open to working together for the benefit of the patient. And I think that's the message that Bill and I really wanna stress is that it, it's about the patients, it's about helping the city of Cincinnati. And, and I think we have so much talent in this town, so much talent um, that we should be working together um, to move the needle. So, yeah. so, so I had a question that if uh, we should replicate what uh, our colleagues in Kentucky are doing and potentially have similar maybe once a month or something like that meetings, uh, uh, because if uh, they're successful, maybe that would be successful here yeah. as well. Bill wanted to say something, I think. We can, we can probably you can build on what already uh, Dr. Ahmed said, you know, if they have if you have, they have tumor board, you can build on it a research component uh, that, you know, you know, if there is a system already is working on, try to build on it is better than, you know, trying to create a new system. But, but you know, I, I think the, the application is, does that at least in terms of the listing all the available clinical trials. So, so yeah, I was just saying, if you can collaborate with the mic, please, yeah, hand the mic. 
because of the people who are virtually listening. Yeah, I was going to say that if we collaborate as a consortium with all the potential patient numbers, we can become very attractive nationally as an accrual site. And we have a great resource locally uh, with CTI. And so as a practical consideration, uh, we could ask for help with CTI and identifying a particularly attractive protocol to all of us. If we all accrued to demonstrate that what we could accomplish together, we could become very attractive nationally, I think. Question in the back. So I practice some malignant hematology and in that area, one uh, difficulty which I face in last three, four months, for example, we have that uh, leukemia trial at UC, but they required a bone marrow biopsy specimen collection. And I had a patient who went there and she did not qualify. It, so she, she's coming back to me. So I was wondering if there is any way we can like collect the, like remove the regulatory barriers from the clinical trial standpoint so that we can send the specimen from our own institution and they can then look remotely the patient and if the patient qualify we can transfer the care to the other institution rather than transferring and then back coming physically to us i think that yeah i think that's that's an important question and that's actually what i was trying to get at with my covid question is the lessons we've learned during covid and the lesson to me is that we have to be nimble we can't be rigid i think you know part of the old paradigm of being rigid prevented us from actually making progress and rolling patients on trials. And now we need to be nimble. These are the lessons we learned during COVID. To be successful during those trying times, we changed how we did things and we discovered it still works. So it's okay to have a biopsy here and get treated there. It's okay to get imaging here and get surgery there. And you know, again, I, I think that's the lesson that we should walk away from this past year is that you know, we don't have to do what we've always been taught to do believing that that's the only way things would work. We're learning that that's not the only way and, and being nimble and mobile, I think is an important lesson. Shalon. So um, I was very impressed by sort of the depth and, and the, in both the, the, the trial programs and all the different institutions and, and the different flavor that all the institutions were really bringing. Um, the, the state of Texas has a, um, a cancer fund for the state called CPRIT, and CPRIT for the last couple of years has been trying to develop a pan state of Texas clinical trial network. And the model that they're presenting is to have small networks develop locally, regionally within their catchment areas, and then they will connect all of them together. What we learned through that process is, um, is that the barriers uh, to Dr. Ma's point are, are not really the protocol specific barriers or the physician related barriers. They're the regulatory barriers between the institutions and the business agreements and how do we screen, screen patients. And, um, and, and if there is an opportunity for the administrators to get together and to come up with a strategy where protocols that are open at one can be open at others, shared IRB, uh, can be one process, single budget, single review. Th those types of operational um, steps can really make it easy to, if a study is open at Christ, it becomes available at, at same ease and it becomes available at, um, um, at Jewish and at, at the university. Any other questions? Yes. To speak to your point, um, honestly, in Pat's perfect world, the, the, the process of opening a clinical trial should be, do you have a patient? Are you interested in participating in a clinical trial? And you, can you follow directions? That's it. That should be the, the, the process. I don't know how to get there yet, but that should be the process. I think the, the other um, area that, that I've always thought about um, in terms of collaboration. One is sharing of clinical trials, but as, um, as Tricia mentioned, is that we should be working together to open trials, innovative trials that we're designing, that we're opening amongst institutions. And, and lastly, we, we saw earlier the power of data collection. Jeremy Warner presented on the COVID consortium. So there's no reason why we couldn't do something similar like that. A prospective registry, collecting data, um, and um, answering questions. Um, you know, in the beginning, it would take a few years to collect the data, but 
there are softwares available like REDCap databases that are that are uh, uh, free to access, and you know we have infrastructure. Um, within the R Cancer Center that could maintain things like that. Um, it does require some, some work power flow from all the other institutions. But those are kind of the collaborations that we, be, we should be thinking about in terms of you know, data collection, doing innovative research, asking questions, putting out abstracts, and kind of putting the city on the map. Um, Probably, you know what, then, uh, you know, as a follow up to this, we may have to schedule not a regular meeting, at least another follow up meeting with the with the panelist and probably whoever else is interested and, you know, just like a, an, another follow up meeting to sit down together and go over the different mm -hmm. options and, and then see what will be the best next step, uh, you know, you know, for the for the region, uh, you know, research uh, efforts to be, to, you know, uh, synergizing together, you know. Great. Thank you very much. It was a, a, a great day. You learned a lot and, and hopefully um, many of us saw each other in person rather than two dimensional on our screen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And thank you for the distinguished speakers for a great session. And it show you how much this region is rich with uh, um, expertise and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll build on that. And finally, so we are toward the end of the meeting today. It was a great day. It was great having all of you. So please, if you don't mind uh, to give us your feedback, the evaluation, you know, so we can make the next meetings better. Um, thank you for being here. Those who came in person and those who join us virtually. Looking forward for other meetings in the near future. Thank you very much. Take care.